Dean, who is himself, um, not only is, a, is he a legend in his own house, he's a, he is actually the founder of a very interesting startup, which is in stealth, but we're going to out him today. So, Andrew, before we do anything, tell, tell everyone listening about now.tv. Well, it's been in stealth, Keith, as you know, better than anyone for about 12 years. We've been talking about this, now.tv. You, uh, you acquired the URL, what, in 2008, 2009, I think? And maybe been, even maybe even earlier than that, actually. Yeah, well, around then. So we've been talking about doing something, sort of reinventing television, reinventing the internet, reinventing CNN, reinventing this, reinventing that. And given the crisis, given we're all stuck at home and we're redesigning our homes as movie studios, uh, I've finally taken the plunge and you're too busy to do it, so I'm doing it on my own. Well, I, my interpretation is you're too Andrew Keen to be doing it with me, so you're doing it on your own. Because like all good entrepreneurs, <clears throat> you want to own the outcome and the journey, and you, as you should. So I'm really playing the same role vis-a-vis -vis you as I played vis-a-vis -vis Mike Larrington at TechCrunch. My, yeah, Mike, that, that's a nice way of putting it. I would also say, and I shouldn't be being critical of you because uh, you're my chairman and major investor at the time, that when we came up with this idea in 2008, you were very much into the idea of creating a, a, a sort of user-generated television network, a real-time version of CNN, which would be fed by Twitter and all the other social media platforms, undermining the expertise and professionalism. And over the last 12 years, you and I have had this ongoing debate about the value of curated professional top-down media versus user-generated. And even you will admit, I think, that your vision has been proved to be uh, less compelling than mine. Well, you know, I, I feel hurt, uh, hurt by that. Um, um, there are many compelling visions. So if you ask me whether 4 billion smartphones in the world with yeah. cameras and microphones might produce an interesting real-time news experience, I think I'd still say yes. But you'd have to give me somewhere between 15 and $30 million to prove it. Whereas- Yeah, and I would, I would accept that, although I wouldn't say interesting experience. I would say disturbing. All you have to do is go on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter to, to have that experience. Uh, I guess it's interesting for about a minute or two, and then it gives you a headache, and then it begins to worry you because it's clearly undermining democracy and, and, and most of the rest of things we have. I I'm very tempted here to tell uh, anyone that watches this about the difference between um, uh, a Yorkshireman and a North London Jew when it comes to optimism versus pessimism. Yeah. <laughs> but um, they, we'll leave it to them to figure out which one of us is an optimist and which one and of us. And you note that Keith, is, um, he doesn't uh, religiously identify. Yorkshiremen are all what, Christians, whereas North Londoners can be Jews, but not all of them. Exactly. You just happen to be one, one, and and Yorkshiremen are particularly uh, miserable one, right? And you're a particularly optimistic Yorkshireman. Yeah, I think most Yorkshiremen are basically atheists. Uh, is my guess. Uh, I, I well, they they believe in Yorkshire. They believe in Yorkshire. Absolutely, Yorkshire is like Texas for those American listeners, as in the people that live there believe they live in their own country. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, what we're going to do today is we we are going to. Uh, I, 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 at Archimedes uh, dot Studio, I help founders tell their startup story for investors, and, and of course, all startups have two stories. Um, Andrew just told us the listener story or the consumer story of Now TV, which is um, uh, uh, basically Andrew believes that quality and substance. Um, is, a, is missing and needs to be brought back to internet broadcasting. Um, and, I, and I don't disagree with that, otherwise I wouldn't be his chairman. Um, but that's, that's the listener story. In order for a startup to be successful, it needs to have an investor story, which, which definitely includes the listener story, but it goes beyond that. And uh, uh, it takes me usually 
you know, somewhere like three months to work with a founder to get them to be able to do a good job of the investor story. But we're going to try and do it in 20 minutes. So, and Andrew, let's start with the unrehearsed, you know, elevator pitch to an investor for Now TV. Well, and, and, and Keith was very generous there. He told me to prepare, but of course, like any entrepreneur, startup guy, I haven't because I'm so arrogant that I, I don't believe I need to prepare. So now I'm going to be embarrassed. I think the investor pitch is we're ready now to take on CNN. Uh, the technology is there and actually in the coronavirus crisis has forced all of our hands. We're all turning our homes into uh, television studios. Uh, the, the quality of my, I mean, and this is an interesting pitch because I'm being helped by the medium. The, this, um, my room has been outfitted uh, by my tech team as a 70 or 80 percent uh, movie television studio. So we have high-end computers and cameras and lighting. And I think we're at a point now where we can run really high quality movie television experiences out of our homes. And obviously the coronavirus has not only enabled that from the producer side, but also from the, the consumer side. I think after this crisis, if there is an after this crisis, uh, who knows at this point, um, I think c consumers will be increasingly unable or indifferent to the distinction between the, the high quality experience online and on their television. So what the coronavirus crisis has done um, in terms of media is dramatically accelerated the way in which digital is eating analog and, 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 and software is eating the old television movie business. So that's, so that's a good answer. I mean, one of the first rules of an investor pitch is that your idea has to be benefiting from some inevitable trends that are irreversible. And you've picked out a couple of trends there. Uh, the, the trend to broadcasting in a high quality way from the place you live is now entirely doable and relatively inexpensive compared to a, a, a full-end, top-end TV studio. And secondly, the listener experience where the TV screen is just another screen. Um, it's probably got an Apple TV or a Roku plugged into it or, a, or, a, or an Amazon Fire Stick um, or it's using built-in apps um, and people no longer distinguish between um, broadcast TV run by NBC and a show that you might put on. And can I interrupt here because what the coronavirus crisis has done has meant that NBC and CNN are also essentially becoming home television networks because then nobody's going into the studio anymore. So when you w watch Meet the Press or, or Jake Tapper's uh, CNN, excellent Sunday CNN show, the, in, the, the people being interviewed are all doing it from home. So there really yeah. is increasingly no difference. There's increasingly no difference. Now, the other, the other element of an investor story, and, and um, just so is it's not a trick question, let me preface it with this. Most investors um, are asking themselves the question, how much will this person return to me over, let's say, 10 years? So even though they're obsessed with short-term traction, the reason they're obsessed with short-term traction is because they're trying to figure out what it is you're going to build and whether you'll be successful over the life of their investment horizon, which is typically, you know, to use a number, it's 10 years, but it's between seven and 13 years. So when you look at these inevitable trends and you look at what you're planning to do, how would you, just at a very high level, before you get into the detail, get this investor to believe that there's a big outcome for them? Well, I would try to convince them that um, that there is, a, a, alongside the technological trends, because that doesn't, that isn't a reason to invest, um, that there is both demand from the producer and the consumer. Uh, I, I'm convinced that the old star system of CNN or the television networks don't work anymore. The, the tiny group of people on CNN are usually very dull and they're stale and people are bored with them. Uh, there's a new group of curators, a new class of experts.
whose interest is sometimes generated from business or from universities or from media, who are just as able to broadcast their brands, their expertise, their form of entertainment to the world, but they don't currently have a window. They're not able to get their message out. Sure, they can go on Twitter, they have Facebook and Instagram pages, but you talk to most creative people, most writers, um, most want-to-be broadcasters, and they're very frustrated with the way in which they get their message out. Uh, these are the people, th these are not Kara Swisher. This is not David Brooks. These are the people below these, the, the real superstars of the old information economy, but they have as, as much to say. Uh, so from the, 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 the content producer point of view, I think uh, the world is not really seeing the wisdom that this new class of information uh, producer can create. And on the other hand, I think in the midst of all the chaos of the internet, the fact that everyone is more and more, consumers are more and more concerned with um, more and more concerned with fake news, with propaganda, with the, 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 uh, the, 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 the lack of generosity and openness of user-generated content. I think there's more and more demand from consumers for high-quality media. Let me give you an anecdote to that. Uh, earlier this week, um, a friend of mine, Yasha Munk of... Uh, uh, a writer on democracy and a, a pretty distinguished, well-known uh, Washington, D.C.-based academic. He's at Johns Hopkins. Uh, launched a network which he called Persuasion in association with a group of kind of writer superstars around the world, including people like um, Elif Shafak, the, the Turkish writer, uh, and, and a number of other well-known figures. Uh, in a day, he had, and, and he's... This is not a video network. This is more of a sort of audio entertainment writing network. Uh, in a day, he had 12,000 signups. And I think of those 12,000, most of them were paid. So I think there's demand. And I think the success of networks like the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post means that the public is willing to pay for high quality uh, information and entertainment. You see it with Netflix. You see it, I'm just looking at this new movie network, Mubu. Um, we have recognized over the last 10 to 15 years that quality information, quality in, uh, entertainment um, doesn't come for free. So uh, sure, you can get the crap for free on the internet, but ultimately it's worthless. Uh, you know, Spotify even is a good example of this. So, uh, so I think from both... Uh, in terms of a product and a, and, a, and, a, and a consumer, I think the time is now right in historical terms for the emergence of new kinds of television. So I would, I would say, Andrew, that that demonstrates your passion and, and, and some vision, but it doesn't yet answer the investor question because demand, demand needs to be quantified. So the nearest you got to it was at the end then when you talked about 12,000 signups and they were all paying. So the real question, if you really come down to it, the real question is this, how many people will be paying you? Um, and this could be subscribers or advertisers, depending on the business model or both or sponsors or all three, but how many people will be paying you? Let's, let's just pick a number and say 10 years from now. And, and how much might they collectively be paying? So what kind of scale of business could this be? Um, that's really what you need to be able to put into the very early high level trends that you point to, that there is some value in these trends and you figured out a way to realize that value and own it. And now what you, what, what you did do is talk about what you're going to do rather than how much what you're going to do is worth. Well, I, what I like about the, the now.tv idea is it's, I wouldn't say it's infinitely scalable, but it's radically scalable. Uh, what I'm going to do over the next few months is work on a single show, my own show. I'm an experienced um, journalist and broadcaster as well, to show that it can be done. But once I show it can be done, 
I think that we can build a network of 50 to 100 uh, brands like myself uh, and uh, combine those into a very compelling channel, which can generate revenue in a number of different ways, obviously through paid audience, although I'm not 100% convinced with that. Certainly sponsors and advertisers. I have enough corporate relationships to know that even now I could probably get a couple of sponsors because they believe in me and they'd be willing to take a risk. I think that the, the network element is very valuable. I think ultimately, um, as your friend at Mike, uh, you, you, uh, Mike Arrington, your friend at TechCrunch learned, uh, physical events are also extremely valuable. At some point, this coronavirus nightmare, we're all stuck at home, is going to come to an end and we'll go back, I think, with more enthusiasm to physical events. So I think there are lots of different ways that you can uh, build revenue. But what excites me in particular is its scalability. The fact that if you can show um, individuals that they can develop video networks effectively, if you can show them how to do it, if you have audience, if you have the technology, if you have the know-how to knit them together, then I think it becomes a compelling business case. That's why I think that the, the persuasion idea um, is, is intriguing because uh, Yasha Munk got 15 or 20 of his famous writer friends together and that automatically created a network, even though you had no idea of what the network was or what it would do. What I want to do is do that the other way. I want to show that you can build a single show and then build it out uh, with a little bit more patience and thought. I think that ultimately that's a more scalable model. Well, it, it, that in a way is what Mike did with TechCrunch. Um, uh, but after five years and, and Mike worked unbelievably hard by the way and put himself under the most enormous pressure uh, because he was controversial as i think you probably will be in some cases as well and therefore he got he got lots of haters as you tend to do on the internet um, and at the end of the day when TechCrunch was sold to aol um, I, I don't want to disclose any secrets but um, uh, let's say from a venture point of view it was a modest outcome um, it, it was a wonderful outcome for Mike, uh, but from a venture point of view, it was a modest outcome. And um, what I was trying to get to with Now TV is, uh, I, I definitely believe that if you look at the, let's assume we're just talking about the English speaking middle class as an audience, um, you're probably talking about something in the region of 100 million potential people who would find this interesting in the world. Yeah. And you, you know, it wouldn't be a lot of people, a lot of non English, uh, non English speaking people in Germany and Northern Europe. Yeah. North English America all speak English anyway. So it's and that adds a whole additional number. Let, let's put it up to 500 million, maybe uh, out of seven and a half billion people who would be a target audience. And let's say um, we managed to get a hundred people like yourself in the years ahead who are compelling in their own right in their fields of wisdom and so on and that the um, the formats we choose are compelling and accessible and consumable it wouldn't seem unreasonable that you could turn uh, that 500 million into somewhere between 10 and 50 million advocates and engaged people that would be worth in it, uh, you know, each of them worth 20 to $50 a year to a, to a business. Well, then you start doing the math and, and, and it is a very big opportunity. Uh, it, it's CNN like, CNN's revenues I think are around two and a half billion, last time I looked. Yeah. It's CNN like in its scale um, and it's way less expensive to run than CNN due to all the innovations. Um, uh, and so uh, I, think, I think it would be easy to make the case, which we, we, uh, let's just move on now, but that this is a, this is a big outcome if, if the right things happen. Yeah, and to compare myself with Mike, when I, I appreciate the comparison because I'm a big admirer of what he achieved. Um, 
his goal at Tech, I don't even know what his original goal at TechCrunch was. I mean, you know that better than I do. It, it was just to learn uh, through interaction with participants. But he never saw this as scalable. He never saw founding TechCrunch as a moment to spawn many tech crunches. Uh, Mike had no brand before he founded it, except in his own mind. So he built his own brand. I did it brilliantly, and he's certainly an incredibly talented and hardworking person. But he, he, he never saw TechCrunch as infinitely scalable in the way we're thinking of now.tv. We're not calling it Andrew Keen.tv. We're not, we're not thinking of it just as a platform for myself. I'm the guinea pig and the pioneer. I want to show that this can be done. And having done that, then I can build out a broader network. Yeah, I, I see it as a much better idea than, say, Cheddar or Young Turks in that sense. Yeah, but, and it's still not entirely clear what Cheddar or Young Turks is or they want to be when they grow up. Um, there still hasn't been really, I, I think, a successful online video platform or, well, platform, but network built, given the ubiquity of YouTube. I mean, it's a, it's a hugely ambitious and complicated challenge. I, I, I'm not going to pretend that I understand 5% of, of, of what needs to be done, but I, I think it's, it's an interesting opportunity. Now, now, normally, and we'll skip this bit, but normally what I do next is talk about your credentials for being the person to do this. And I think it'll just take us read that your last five to 10 years have all been about creating the Andrew King that is a credible person to do this. And let's just take that as read. Yeah, and let me add, and I think this is actually, most people won't know this, is that you and I first met when I... Uh, you gave me a job at Santa Cruz Networks, which was a very early video platform doing when, when I came on board, it was a pornography platform where people were uh, in real time taking off their clothes and, 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 and fantasizing with one another. Um, so we've been in this uh, video, real time video space for many years. Uh, I, I was a business development guy before I was a critic of the internet. So I have some experience yeah. of the business as well. Just, just, just so listeners and viewers don't get the wrong impression, I too joined it when it was a porn network. <laughs> I didn't make it a porn network. Right. And Keith has always given, uh, Keith doesn't, he doesn't need me to, uh, to trumpet his strengths. And I don't want to build up his ego too much because it's pretty big already. But uh, he, he did teach me one or he's taught me more than one thing. But one thing in particular is always taught me about scale. So when he got to Santa Cruz Networks, it was a single real time video show, basically a sort of a soft porn early, uh, early video thing. It was about 2000. They, call, they called it a biker bar. It was a yeah. biker bar. So but it was people it was early. It was uh, um, it was, uh, it was, you know, people who were dabbling with, with video in the very early stages. By the way, it was... But, but what Keith did was when he came on as CEO, is again, he tried to scale it. Rather than focusing on the sale of one, uh, one platform, one biker bar real-time video platform, he wanted to box up the technology and sell it to other people trying to sell, um, trying to sell video. So Keith has educated me always in the the value of scale and of thinking beyond a single show, trying to scale your business from, you know, a few thousand to a few million to a few hundred million. Maybe you, if I was to criticize you, you always think too big, but it's certainly better to think too big than too small. Yeah. You just reminded me that I actually took that pornography business and sold it to David Warden, who was the founder of Ask Jeeves, who had the ambition to repackage it and call it Ask Mimi. Um, and, and to be fair to Santa Cruz Networks, it wasn't, um, it wasn't an absurd business. I mean, Draper invested in Santa Cruz Networks at the same time that they invested in Skype. They saw Santa Cruz Networks as the video sister to Skype as an audio platform. So we know what happened to Skype. Uh, let's move, a lot of let's, this stuff is, is timing again. Well, let's move on because we, we have to stop in about eight minutes. So big trends valuable if you execute. You have the credentials to be the person to do it. So the next thing an investor wants to know is if, if I give you money today, what, what's the journey look like? 
you, you've already said that initially you want to start with one show and you've also said you want to end up with maybe a hundred shows um, that can fill a week. Um, what's the journey in your mind? I mean, obviously it will be ill-defined in part, but do you have a sense of the roadmap and the journey? Yeah, um, and, and let's be clear, uh, I'm not looking for money right now. At the moment, this is self-financed. So what I want to do over the next six months is show that you can build a credible 30-minute daily video show that will come close to replicating a CNN show. Having done that, we will go out and raise some money. And I want to, if you like, box up my experience and then equip maybe 20 or 50 or even 100 people like myself to build similar shows. The money then would, to, to do that, the capital would, would require investment in their hardware, in their training, in building out the network. Uh, so it would be, it would be multiplying my experience by 20 or 50 or a hundred. Now, I still want you to fill in the blanks a little bit, because this is a 10 year journey that I've got in my mind as an investor. I'm the one with the checkbook, even though you don't want money. Um, if you do the right thing, I'm going to plead with you to take my money because I'm going to get greedy. So, okay. You start with one show. Uh, you don't need a lot of money for that. You want to get to 100 shows and potentially 50 million attached viewers that really identify with, with Now TV, Now Dot TV. Um, two or three big milestones that you think you have to achieve along that journey. Two or three milestones. Well, I, I think the first would be signing up high quality talent. I think that signing up 20 or 50 people of my, uh, of my status as writers, as broadcasters, as experts, subjects experts. Uh, I think that's critical. I think uh, also bringing on not advertisers, but sponsors. I think finding corporations who are willing to commit to this would be another significant milestone. Um, and then of course, having traction when it comes to viewers, to consumers. I mean, it's all very well talking about this. It sounds great, but you've got to attract viewers. I know I've got a, a, a real time, uh, I've got a daily podcast show uh, that's getting two or 300,000 listens, month, which is good. Uh, and it takes time and, and effort. Uh, so I think it's really important. It's all very well coming up with a good idea, but if if people aren't interested in it, then it's irrelevant. And I think a lot of this is chicken and egg. I mean, how are you going to get good people? You're going to get good people because um, because I can prove I have audience. Well, how am I going to get audience? Because I've got good people. So my experience of being an entrepreneur is you have to juggle those things. Doesn't mean you tell untruths, but you have to be able to to have the chicken and the egg simultaneously in in a credible way. So that makes me, you know, I'm starting to have this picture in my mind that you you are you are to PBS and NPR what Netflix is to the movies. You you're basically taking the right. core of PBS which is sponsorship, talent and audience to the internet and scaling it globally um, without being public public broadcast your it's going to be a private company in the same way that Netflix took an existing set of movies and TV shows and created a whole new way of consuming them. Right. Yeah, I think that's a nice way of putting it. And when you think of the, the effort, I mean, think of something like State of the Nation, um, or, uh, or, or, uh, uh, or the Jake Tapper show. Um, it, it takes huge teams to produce this stuff. And what we're talking about, is replicating these by 100x uh, at a hundredth of the price. Um, and if you can get 80% of the quality and the, uh, the, 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 the visual credibility, then I think it becomes an interesting business. My guess is you can get a thousand percent reduction in price, if not 10,000. Yeah. 
and you can get 150% of the quality at, once you scale, once you have, have got a brand. And we're still, uh, hopefully, we're just at the right time when it comes to the tech. Uh, Keith, you and I both outfitted ourselves with PTX cameras. Um, these are remote operated cameras. Basically, what we're able to do is have engineers who can turn everyone's home into studios and control the cameras from there. Uh, but as we move forward, those cameras will become more sophisticated. Uh, everyone's going to get fiber connectivity. I'm lucky enough living in Berkeley to have that fiber connectivity. And again, this is inevitably and unavoidably global. Uh, no. This platform will work as it will be as relevant or as interesting in China or Poland as it is in the United States, in contrast uh, to the NBCs or the NPRs of the world. And I'll, I will just zoom my camera in just to prove that yeah, it's the truth. And I will swivel it to the other side so you can see that I am actually at home. There, you're about to see the view out of my window any second now. There you go. That is my backyard showing up and now it's going to come back slowly but surely um so andrew you said you're not raising any money right now but that won't remain true uh, given the, the 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 initial things you want to do and the journey you want to go on what do you think will be the first amount you want to raise and roughly when do you think that will be well, all things go into plan, of course, which is, is never the case. But I, I hope to be, as I said, I hope to have a credible product by the end of the year. And then I, 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 I think I'd like to go out and raise minimum of half a million, probably about a million dollars um, to, 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 um, to build out the network, to make it credible, to prove that this can be scaled. And there you go. There you have it. 50 million people generating between 10 and $20 um, in revenue 10 years from now. And Andrew wants to raise less, you know, a maximum of a million dollars in the near future. We, of course, are not allowed to market that to you. And this is not a request for you to consider investing. Uh, but um, he's taking donations. <laughs> so, uh, Andrew Keen, that was a trial run of how I work with entrepreneurs to help them tell their startup story. As I said, it normally is at least 10 sessions and it results in a model and a deck and uh, a much better chance of being successful. And we've done it in, uh, I don't know how long, but 20-ish minutes. Uh, so it, it will obviously be incomplete, but it's a good start. Thank you for turning and the I, and to, and to, to, to have a football metaphor, and you're going to take this in the wrong way, Keith, but I think you're actually the Alex Ferguson of the venture business. A Dower Scott. Not a Dower Scott, but someone who didn't necessarily have the most glamorous professional career. Uh, you're not Maradona or Messi or even Mike Arrington, uh, though you might disagree with that. No, I don't. Um, you came close, but you never hit the home run, or you came close to hitting the home run. Uh, but I think you're bringing your wisdom from your experience on the field, off the field, and I think you're going to turn out to be actually a much better manager than you were a player. Not that you were a bad player, but it's in football, the great managers are often fairly... Uh, not, not indistinguished, but not necessarily the greatest of players. So... Alex Ferguson, Marie, Jose, yeah. Klopp. These were people who played the game, who knew the game, but they took their wisdom from the field. So anyone watching this, I would strongly recommend Keith. Coaching, uh, coaching is fun. Uh, but I did want to score from the halfway line. And on that note, we'll finish. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Keith.